Hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk about animism and specifically we're going to explore animism and animistic definitions and animistic perspectives through the lens of what I like to call green animism or our relationship to the plant world and the plant spirits. So to begin, I want to give you a really lovely, really concise definition of animism that comes from one of my favorite teachers, Professor Graham Harvey. And it's a really hard thing to kind of sum up and package up in a nice clean little sentence, but somehow he's managed to do it. And sort of hidden within this simple definition, there are layers upon layers of depth and meaning for us to contemplate and meditate and experience. So I'm gonna give you the definition now, and then we're gonna unpack it a little bit together. And from there, I want to look at what animism is, how it looks in practice, and how it relates to our relationships with the plants. So Graham Harvey's uh, definition of animism is that the world is filled with people, only some of them are human, all of them deserve respect, right? Uh, another fantastic teacher that I love, Arith Harder, would say that the world is populated, completely populated, with people, with persons, right? And the important point here being, not all those persons are human. So that's where animism becomes animism. So if we come back to Graham Harvey's definition, that the world is filled with people, only some of whom are human, all of whom deserve respect we can unpack this a little bit and see what's really going on in the animist perspective. So the first part, the world. What are we talking about when we say the world? First, the world is a placeholder for existence, for being states and for nature, right? And it's important through the animist perspective that we say the world and not the universe or the cosmos, even though this is true everywhere. The idea that the cosmos is filled with people is true. The idea that the universe or the multiverse is filled with people, absolutely true. But in our definition of animism, we say the world is filled with people because animism is a spirituality and a perspective, a life way and an experience based on imminence and immediacy what's real and what's tangible and where your personal points of connection and relationship are, are really all that matter, right? So we can understand that these same ideas can be applied universally in this just massive spectrum, but we are where we are, right? Animism is fundamentally a land, place, and time-based practice, right? So wherever you be, whoever you be, whenever you be, is the guiding principles of the way that animism expresses for you as an individual, right? It's a place-based tradition. So when we say the world, we talk about the space around us, the building that we're in right now, the neighborhood that we're in, the forest that we're in, the city that we're in, the uh, continent that we're on, the sky that we're under, right? The world is that state of immediacy around us. The actual land, the actual sky that contains us is what's important. The little bubble of being that we live in, right? I think about uh, driving down a dark road in the middle of the night and your headlights are on, maybe even your brights, right, are on. So you can only really see as far as the lights go. And then every you know, little bit you drive, you can see a little further, a little further, a little further. Animism is sort of like that in the sense that we focus our attention on what's happening around us, what's real, what's manifesting, right? What signs and symbols we're getting in the moment. We're aware that that stretch of highway goes 100 miles ahead of us. We're aware of it, we hold space for it, we honor it, but our focus is on the stretch of road that is meaningful and relevant to what we can control, where our relationships are happening, the stretch of road that 
that's under our tires right now. If we try to correct our steering based on a change in the road a mile away, we'll wreck, right? We'll turn too soon. So instead, we kind of play with nature. We play with the world. We work on re relationships based on what's in our light, kind of what, what is within the encompassment of our campfire, right? And this is an old sort of way of symbolizing the world is the ancients going out into these kind of scary wild spaces. You know, think about being in the middle of a forest at night where all the shapes are hard to define and it's hard to get around and there are wild creatures that, are, that might hunt you and attack you. So you light a campfire, right? And that campfire not only provides light and warmth and comfort for you, but it kind of shines out in all directions and makes this little orb of light around you. And so in the moment, that's your world, right? That's your little bubble. So when we say the world is filled with people, that's the world we're talking about. A state of immediacy, um, imminence, and relevance for who we are as individual people and our communities, of course, right? So then the next part is filled with, right? The world is filled with people. What we want to say, what's being meant by that is there is, in fact, presence everywhere, right? We're not necessarily packed in like sardines, but there are, through the lens of animism, many, many interlaced, interdependent, interrelated layers of reality and existence. Not all of them are perceptible to all of the others, right? So while I am sitting here alone, seemingly, in my apothecary, talking to you, there are other beings that can be moving through this space imperceptible to me. Similarly, I might be imperceptible to them, right? So that level of things. But more importantly and more relevant to our green animism, our work with the plant spirits, our work with uh, this nature-based spirituality, is that many of these people that we're talking about are beings that we normally, in our modern day, do not ascribe personhood to. So, animals are fully sovereign people through the animist perspective. Plants are fully aware, fully conscious, fully wise, sovereign people through the animist perspective. Many locations and spaces are indwelled by a conscious, individual, aware, sovereign spirit. So the space that you are in is full of people, right? Not necessarily literally that you're swimming in people, but that when you walk out into the world, and encounter a plant or an animal or a tree or a spring or river or mountain, especially those that have garnered a lot of special attention and kind of have some magnetism to them, you are in the presence of a person. In the same way that if you and I were in the same room together right now, we would each be in the presence of another person. So the world is full of persons. It's an invitation for us to step out of our very, very limited, conditioned way of acknowledging personhood, right? Uh, it allows us to recognize that humans are not only not the only type of person in the world, but that we are far from the most powerful or most meaningful person in the world, which we will get to in a moment. So this first invitation after understanding what the world is, right, is recognizing that there are many, many, many countless people who share this world with us, and some of them we can perceive and interact with, like plants and animals, and some of them we cannot, like the fair folk, the ancestors, the mighty dead, and other kinds of spirits. So this is foundational to the animistic perspective, and to spiritual nature-based practices that are fueled by and informed by an animist worldview. So we have the world is filled with, and then we come to people. This is the good part, right? So what is a person? We 
generally only ascribe or honor personhood when it expresses itself in other human beings, right? We talk about people and we're talking about humans. We talk about a person, we're talking about a human. Rarely within our own inner dialogue or in our external dialogue with other humans, do we refer to or think of as an animal, as a person, right? Generally animals are given it pronouns, uh, unless we happen to know a, a gender and ascribe a gender pronoun, generally animals are it, right? Uh, I was walking through the forest and I saw a bear and I'm so, so thankful it went the other way. It, right? Uh, we do this with, with plants as well and trees and spaces. So this word person in this definition is the next invitation for us to expand who gets to be a person, right? It's not really up to us anyway. But when we step into conscious contract with the idea that not only humans are people, that plants are people, animals are people, spaces can be indwelled by people, and that there are spiritual people who, again, may or may not be perceptible to us in the way that you and I can easily perceive one another, that is an initiation back into living in a world that is saturated with magic. Right? A lot of us lived in that world when we were kids, and then we get conditioned out of it in order to fit in and in order to sort of match our language, internal and external, with the, the established language, uh, the systemic established language of the machine, right? But it's incorrect. So uh, this is a toxicity, it's a hoax, right? It's a trick, and part of the great work of those of us who have lost our connection to our ancestral traditions of animism is in getting ourselves back into that way of thinking, back into that way of walking through the world, acknowledging, allowing space for other people to be people. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle with letting other human beings be people, you know? Uh, there's this saying that, that I have heard before that I really like and I remember it, uh, to be kind because other people are people too, right? So it's even easy for us to forget that other humans are fully, fully fleshed out, sovereign, conscious humans with complex emotions and histories and wants and needs and fears and pains. It's easy for us to forget other humans have that. So it's really, it's work. We have a lot of muscles uh, atrophied muscles to flex and to, to pump up in order to step back into a place where we can also walk through a park and acknowledge that every tree, every blade of grass, every plant, every bird, every fox, every dog, every cat, and every other human who share that world with us, that space with us, that reach of our campfire, is a fully sovereign person, conscious, aware, communicative, filled with hopes and dreams and desires, goals, fears, pains, narratives, histories, traumas, all of it, just like you have. Uh, and that's the simple part of it, is that when we spin out and when we get lost about, well, what is a person, right? What does it mean for a plant to be a person or for uh, an animal to be a person? Just come back to yourself and say, well, who am I? What makes me who I am? What allows me to be the strong and vulnerable being that I am, right? And it, it, it boils down to, we have narrative and history and goals and thoughts and feelings and all of that. And so we say, if I have all of these things and I'm a person, then I allow for all other people also to have these things. And then the invitation from that realization is to try to walk through the world behaving like all of that is true. That's the hard part, right? For me anyway, uh, is that you then have to walk through the world as our deep ancestors do. And I say are because it doesn't matter at all who your deep ancestors are. It does not matter. Animism is the oldest unifying shared spiritual uh, perspective of our world, right? 
no matter where you hail from, where your ancestors came from, how you got to where you are now, what's happened to your people between point A and point B, at one point, animism for your ancestors was the way, right? So we're gonna get into that a little bit later in this class because it's such a powerful medicine, a powerful balm on the things that we're working on in the world right now. But for now, suffice it to say, um, you have it within you, right? It's in there to call up. And the work of animism is that invitation to walk out into the world, be fully who you are with pride and power, and to allow space for all other people to be valuable and meaningful and matter because they are people, right? Just by holding that space, <clears throat> walking through the world that way, many of the problematic things that happen within us start to shift, right? They start to heal, they bubble up, we get these new perspectives of them. It's pretty, pretty incredible, pretty magical. So animism is global and timeless and innate to all people including human people. And when we move on in this definition, the world is filled with people, some of whom are humans, all of whom deserve respect, right? We can understand now that some of whom are humans. We have to start with that disclaimer because the human brain, for most humans, not all of us, we still have many, many uh, cultures and groups of people who are actively practicing animist perspectives and have never lost it, have never changed it, have never had it changed, have held on to it through conditioning and colonization and all of that. And it's a, a beautiful testament to the power of this way of living and this way of thinking. Um, but we have to start with some of whom are human as a gentle reminder to humans that we're not the only ones here. You know, we're, it's not the human show. Uh, it's not about us. And one thing that I like to unpack from this line that some of the people in this world are humans is, again, some of the people are humans. We are not the majority and we are not the most powerful, right? We're actually uh, closer to the minority when it comes to personhood in, in this world and in the universe at large, really. And it's a good thing to remember that knock us down a couple pegs help us get humble right because ultimately when we walk through the world thinking that humans are in some way superior that we are in some way the status quo the standard of intelligence of wisdom of how to live life very bad things happen ecologically spiritually emotionally right we start behaving like what we do is more important than what's done to everybody else. So that idea of human supremacy causes many, many of the global issues that we have today. And a return to the medicine of animism <clears throat> helps to fix it.